Assalamualaikum and hi to everybody. We are going to learn basic kada atra sound today. The objectives are first, you have to understand basic principle and technique of basic kada atra sound. Second, to know the method acquiring standard image of basic kada atra sound. Third, to be able to identify image abnormality and for to understand image interpretation. The outlines are first, we have to learn basic principle of Kada ultrasound. Second, how to get the image acquisition. Third, how to interpret all the images. And lastly, how to integrate all the images. Why eyeballing? Is eyeballing enough to help us in managing patients? There was a study in 2005. They compared eye body injection fraction with former quantitative methods among 89 patients. They found out all former methods correlate significantly with eye body injection fraction. So, don't feel inferior if you are not doing the measurement as eye body is good enough to help us in managing patients. So now let us learn the basic principle in doing ultrasound. We go for how we interrogate the probe so that we can get better images. First, slide. Okay. Sliding is the movement of the probe in any direction to a different part of the chest. Sliding is useful for tracing potential structure distally and proximally. Second, what is this movement called as? Okay. It is tilting. Tilting is the movement where we keep the transducer in the same place on the chest, for example, while changing the scanning plane. Tilting the transducer from one side to another allows other plane in the same axis to come into view. For example, pastoral short axis view, we are tilting the transducer to get image from the apex to base. Okay, next. The third movement. This is what we call as rocking. It is different with tilting. Rocking refers to the movement of the transducer in the same plane as the field of view. And the last movement. is rotate rotating means to keep the transducer in the same place and orientation on the chest while rotating it clockwise or counterclockwise rotating the transducer is the movement used for obtaining different views from the same echo cardiographic windows for example from plex we rotate clockwise to turn to Parastonosial axis view. Another principle in the ultrasound is patient, machine, and you have to be in ergonomic environment in order to get good quality images. Ideally, we sit like in this picture. In this picture, but in our clinical setting, doesn't allow us to do so. Usually, we will scan the patient with this position. However, there is a risk of cross-contamination. Cross so, it's better to scan like this picture. But I know it is a bit difficult to scan by using a non-dominant hand. However, if you practice and practice, it is not impossible to do it. Next, the hand should be stable. You can put your medial palm on the chest wall and hold the transducer like a pencil. Some are using the little finger as a stand. And remember, only one movement at one time. Ideally, the patient is put on the left lateral so that the heart is near to the chest wall and the left upper limb in adduction position to get better window avoiding the rib. Just now, we talk about some principle in the cardiac ultrasound. Now, we move to the image acquisition. 
In this basic kada atasal, I will mention four basic views which are plex, paraston long axis view, paraston short axis view, epical four chamber and subcostal four chamber view. And I will touch a bit in doing IVC scanning. We go for the first view, parasternal long axis view. The transducer is placed to left sternum in the third, fourth, and fifth intercostal space, with the marker oriented to the right clavicle, approximately 11 o'clock. Usually, I will start scanning from the second intercostal space, then I drag down the transducer until I get a movement image. Then, I will do rotation or tilting in order to get a standard image. This is a standard view of parasternal long axis. You have to include all these structures in the picture in order to get a standard view. So, the D image criteria will be first is a right ventricle, second interventricular septum, third is a left ventricle, fourth is IOT valve, fifth IOT root, sixth posterior LV wall, seven is a mitral valve, eight left atrium, nine pericardium, the hyperacute line here, and 10 descending thoracic iota. And remember, the standard image also is where the image is two thirds of the screen. LV apex should not be visualized, as if you are able to visualize the LV apex, you are foreshortening the view. And lastly, you have to get same echogenicity of mitral valve and aortic valve. This is the example of a standard clip of parasternal long axis view. Next is parasternal short axis view. From the parasternal long axis, the probe is rotated to clockwise 90 degree. Probe marker to left shoulder. The probe should be treated to get each level of this view. Okay, we go for the first level, which is apical level. LV should be round in shape. Sometimes we can see thrombus in this level. This is LV cavity, anterior wall, septal wall. This is septal wall, anterior wall, lateral wall, and inferior wall. This is RV. The LV is round in shape and this is a pericardium. Next is mid papillary level. This is the best view in assessing regional wall motion abnormality and contractility of the LV. Okay, as you can see here, this is a right ventricle, this is a left ventricle. We start from this. In between the right ventricle and the left ventricle is the septum. So this is the septum, intra interventricular septum. This is the pericardium. In this level, you can see like two knuckles here. This is where the mid papillary level is. Third one is mitral valve level. We can assess morphology of the valve in this level. As you can see, fish mouth appearance here. This is anterior leaflet and below it is a posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Lastly, in parasitical shell assist view, IoT valve level. This level can give us a lot of information as we can see many structures here. We start from the LA, RA, the RVOT, the main pulmonary artery. And sometimes you can see the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. You also can see aortic valve. There are three cuffs there. Near to the Right ventricles is the right coronary cusp. And 
the uh, besides the right coronary calves is the left coronary calves and after that is uh, after the left coronary calves besides the left coronary calves is the non coronary calves we can assess the size of chamber morphology of the valve and sometimes you can see thrombus in the main pulmonary artery Apical four chamber is a tricky view, but it can give a lot of information. The transducer is placed at the point of maximum impulse if the apex be palpable. Otherwise, the transducer is placed at the fifth intercostal space near the anterior axillary line. This is a, the standard view of apical four chamber. You have to include first left ventricle. Second, interventricular septum. Third, right ventricle. Fourth, mitral valve. Fifth, tricuspid valve. Sixth, left atrium. Seventh, interatrial septum. Eighth, right atrium. And the image should be two thirds of the screen. And you have to get same equigenicity of both every valve. If you only can see one valve clearer, then the other valve means that you are slanting the cut. The septum should be running straight down in the middle. And RA, LA is oval in shape. If it appears global, it is foreshortening view. This is the example of the standard image of apical four chamber. We move to the subcostal four chamber view, or we can call it as a rescue view. Sometimes, if patient is hyperinflated, it's very difficult to get parasternal long axis, parasternal short axis, and apical four chamber. But this view is easily to manipulate. If you are over treating, the size will look bigger than normal, for example. This view can help us in diagnosing cardiac tamponade. The transducer is placed below and slightly to the right of sternum. The side marker is rotated to 3 o'clock and tilted anteriorly. This is the standard view of subcostal 4 chamber. The image criteria first, liver. Liver act as acoustic window. Second, right ventricle. Third, tricuspid valve. Fourth, right atrium. Fifth, Interventricular septum, 6. Interatrial septum, 7. Left ventricle, 8. Mitral valve, 9. Left atrial, and 10. Pericardium. You have to be able to see the whole pericardium, and the both every valve should be seen as same echogenicity. This is the example of the standard view of subcostal four chamber after we know how to get a standard image then we move to image interpretation remember you have to get a standard image first before the interpretation if not you will interpret the image wrongly this is a systematic approach to interpret cardiac images first you go for the size how's the RA size, RV size, LA size, and LV size. Then you go for the shape. How's the shape of the RA, RV, LA, and LV? Then go for the thickness. How the thickness of the LV valve? How's the thickness of the RV valve? How the thickness of the valve? And then you move to the motion. How the contractility of the RV? How the contractility of the LV? How the movement of the valve and lastly pericardial space either there is effusion or cardiac tamponade start from the left of the screen this is apical four chamber view from the apical four chamber view we can see the la lv ratio is one third to two third rv to lv is one third to two third Size of LA similar. Size of LA and RA is similar. 
LV is bullet, bullet in shape and RV is crescent in shape. From the parasternal long axis view, we can see the size of RV, IOTA and LA. The ratio is 1 to 1 and 2 1. How about the LV wall thickness? LV wall thickness you can see from the parasternal short axis. The normal size is less than 1 cm. You can eyeball it by seeing from the ruler at the side. The RV, RV wall thickness can be uh, seen at the subcoaster 4 chamber view. The normal RV wall thickness is less than 0 0.5 cm. Okay, this is the normal size of a pickle 4 chamber. To the left of the screen, what you can see here. Okay, there is RA and RV dilatation. Okay, we move to the right side of the screen. How about this? What you can see here? This is LV dilatation. We move to the size. Okay, this is example for normal size of RV, IOTA and LA. We move to the left side of the screen. What you can see here? Yes, there is a dilatation of the aortic root. Okay, move to the right side of the screen. What you can see here? Left atrium dilatation. Left atrium bigger than the iota and RV. Okay, we move to the shape. The left screen is normal shape. It's a normal, it's a round shape of LV. How about the right side? Familiar with this image? This is what we call as D shaped LV. LV wall thickness. You can see from the ruler here. Ruler at the side. Normal is less than 1 cm. Okay, how about this? Yes, this is LV wall hypertrophy. You can see the difference, right? Okay, what about LV wall thickness? Okay, the left side is normal. And the right side is RV wall hypertrophy. You have to practice your eyes to see the normal one first. Then you can detect the abnormality of images. We move to regional wall motion abnormality. From the parasternal short axis. Apical 4 chamber and plex, we can assess the RWME, regional wall motion abnormality. My advice is we train our eyes to see the regional wall motion in parasternal short axis first. Then we move to the different view. Very easy to remember. The tip is, this is LV. The upper one is the RV. In between, this is a septum. This is septal territory. The opposite of the septum is lateral territory. Next to the septal is apical territory. And opposite to it is inferior posterior territory. In regional wall motion also, you have to see the type of the movement. Is it this kinesis? The abnormal movement of the part of the LV wall compared to other parts. Hypokinesis, less movement. And echinesis, not moving of the uh, particular wall. Okay, how about the left side of the screen? As you put your finger in the middle, you can see which one is hypokinetic region. If you train your eyes, you can see there is hypokinetic region over the anterior wall. Okay. Contractility. Contractility is an inward displacement and alveolar thickness is more than 30%. 
What is the meaning of this? When LV relax, the wall is thin. When the contraction, the wall is thick. So, if the different value between the thin wall and the thick wall is more than 30%, we can say this LV has good contractility. How about RV contractility? We can see from the RV annular motion. It is good when it can move up to approximately 2 cm by looking at the ruler at the side. By right, we can calculate it doing a tapsy, tricuspic annular plane systole excursion. If the value more than 1.6 cm, the RV contractility is good. This is the example of LV contractility as the image moves towards the right side, it re the contractility reduces. You can see from the left side, good contractility. In the middle, moderate contractility. And the last one is very poor contractility. We move to hyperdynamic and hyperkinetic. From these clips, which one is under volume? Dynamic is characterized, characterized by constant change, activity or progress, from small to big, from low to high, for example. In this context, hyperdynamic is a progress of LV area from small to big. However, hyperkinetic is only fast movement of the wall without change of LV area. Meaning that hyperdynamic contractility is equal to under volume. And hyperkinetic is when fluid or volume is not a main issue. Okay, from the left side, you can see the dynamic progress here. From small area to big area and come back to the small area. Okay, and the right side, no changes of the area. But it's hyperkinetic, the fast movement of the LV wall. So now... You can know which one you can give fluid, which one you have to be careful with the fluid. This is the example of right ventricle contractility. We can practice our eyes to see the normal one first. Then we can know which one is the abnormal one. The left side is normal RV function and the right side is abnormal RV function. As I mentioned before, the norm, we can measure the RV contractility by using TAPSI. I will not go deep for valve. It is good enough if we are able to know the normal morphology of the valve. As you can see, the mitral valve, you can see from the parasten long axis, you can see from the parasten short axis, and the tricuspid valve from the apical four chamber, the, also in the uh, aortic level in parasitic short axis view, aortic valve you can able to see from the aortic level in parasitic short axis view, and pulmonary valve you can see from the base the aortic level as well at uh, the base level the aortic level. There are some abnormalities of the valve. We can comment as thickened anterior valve, for example. As you can see from the slide, the anterior leaflet thickened compared to the posterior leaflet. And something is on the tricuspid valve. You can comment as hyperechoic lesion on the near area of the tricuspid valve. And aortic, uh, the right coronary cuffs of the aortic valve thicken, appears thicken. Okay. Okay. Pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. How to differentiate? It? The quick way is whenever there is pericardial effusion, you can pause the clip and scroll back until you see the AV valve open. Then, why we have to see the AV valve open? The AV valve open is during diastole. Then you check the RV is collapsed or not. If it is collapsed, then it is in tamponade. 
So this is pericardial effusion as the RV not collapse during the stow. Compared to this, this is cardiac tamponade. As you can see, you can pause the image and scroll back. If the RV collapse during diastole, it is in tamponade. I will touch a bit on IVC scanning. It is rough estimation of fluid status. There are two windows, subcostal and the right upper quadrant. It's a rescue view. Maybe some of us have been taught the IVC di diameter can correlate with the estimated RA pressure. Left side is the collapse IVC, but doesn't mean that I if IVC, uh, the right side, the left side is flat IVC, the collapse IVC, and the right side is fat IVC. But it doesn't mean that if IVC is standard, equivalent with patient enough volume. Same with the flat IVC. Okay, if the uh, doesn't mean that flat IVC equal to under volume. There are many caveats in IVC scanning. There are such. It depends on body habitus and position, the uh, the probe pressure and position site of measurement, okay, the positive pressure ventilation, downstream obstruction, respiration, when the patient is technically, the IVC appears smaller, high intraabdominal pressure, also the IVC will appear smaller. IVC scanning uh, cannot stand alone without the basic cardiac ultrasound, without the cardiac ultrasound, but cardiac ultrasound can stand without the IVC. So, for example, if you don't have any clue in the cardiac ultrasound, you cannot get proper cardiac ultrasound, then the IVC can give a clue in uh, managing the patients. Okay? We move to the image integration. Okay. How to assess the parasternal long axis view? As I mentioned before, we have a, a systematic approach okay, by looking at the size, shape, thickness, motion and pericardial space. Okay, you can go structure by structure as uh, shown in this slide. Okay, you can go to the pericardial space, you can Second, you can go to the RV. Is it normal size and contracting normally? Is the septum normal size and moving normally? Is the LV normal size and contracting normally? Does the anterior MV leaflet approximate the septum? Okay, is the RT root normal size? Is there a dissecting flap? Is the LA normal size? And the assessment of personal short axis view examine the shapes and sizes of the ventricle confirming suspected pericardial effusion. If you see another view, we confirm with this, this view. Okay, the probe can be treated to examine uh, parasternal sh short axis in different levels. Like I mentioned before, uh, you can uh, see the regional wall motion abnormality in the mid papillary. You can see the valve disease in the mitral valve level and you can assess size of chambers and valve disease in the aortic level. Epical for chamber, you can go structure by structure as well. Examine the pericardial space, is it in tamponade physiology? Is the LV normal size and contracting normally? Is the septum normal size and moving normally? Is the RV normal size and contracting normally? Is the RA normal size? Is the interatrial septum in a normal position? Is the LA normal size? Is the MV annulus moving up and down, suggesting good long acid function of LV. And lastly, assessment of subcostal for chamber view. Examine the pericardial space. Uh, is it in tamponade? And is the RV normal size and contracting normally? Is the septum normal size and moving normally? Is the MV annulus moving up and down? Is the LV normal size and contracting normally? The assessment will be the same. You if you go structure by structure, by systematic approach, you won't miss anything. 
Okay. Okay, we go for the case discussion. Okay, case one. 32 years old female, history of admission 3 weeks ago for acute appendicitis and she was underwent appendicectomy. She complained of sudden onset SOB this morning. Post discharge 2 weeks, patient not ambulating due to pain on the operation site. So you know, this lady underwent appendicectomy, not ambulating and complained of sudden onset SOB. What is in your mind? Okay, the physical examination, patient was alert and conscious, respiratory rate 40, 40 breaths per minute, the BP 90 over 40, 50, heart rate is 130, tachycardia, SpO2 is only 89% under room air, temperature 37, pink, no jaundice, S1, S2 heard no murmur, the lungs is clear and entry equal bilaterally, no wrong kind, no prolonged aspiratory phase, no crepitation. Adomus soft, not distended, no positive mass, mass, no guarding. However, the right lower limb examination tender at the calf region, warm to touch, no discoloration, DPA and PTA palpable, capillary return less than 2 seconds. Okay. The vital stand is not stable, tachypneic, BP lowish, tachycardic, okay, and the SPO2 only 89%. And she also has right lower limb tender. Then, what you want to do next? Okay, this is the focus. Okay, what you can see here. Like I mentioned before, we have to assess the view by systematic approach so that we don't miss anything. Okay. So, look at the RV. RV bigger than IOTA and LA. Okay, what you can see, if you see carefully, the septal wall is flattened compared to the, the lateral wall there. Okay, and this can is your movement. And the right side of the clip, as you can see, the right side dilated, RA and RV dilated, the LV Smaller compared to the RV by right is LV two third, RV is one third. This is like uh, another way around. Okay. Okay. What you can see from the uh, two point compression test. See the left femoral is it compressible? Yes. Left popliteal. Not compressible. Left popliteal. The above part is the vein. The below part is the artery. So the left popliteal vein not compressible. How about the right side? Is the right femoral vein compressible? It's not fully compressed. Okay, and if you see carefully, you can see the hyperechoic lesion in the femoral vein. How about the right popliteal? It's not compressible as well. So the left popliteal, the right femoral, and the right popliteal are not compressible. So, by looking at the history, the vital sign, the focus, and the additional of two-point compression test, what is your conclusion? DVT with pulmonary embolism. Okay? So, we move to the case 2. 42 years old male, known case of hypertension, diabetes, ESRF, completed 4 hours of HD yesterday. Complaint of sudden onset shortness of breath as well. Okay, the BP 106 over 80, heart rate 120, temperature is 37, DXT is 8.0, SPO2 is 100% under nasoprom, 3 liter per minute. But on examination, coolish peripheries, CRT less than 2 seconds, weak pulse volume, lungs clear, no heart murmurs. Abdomen soft, non tender. Okay, from the vital sign, the heart is tachycardic. Okay, otherwise, the BP borderline low. Coolish peripheries. Okay, weak pass volume. Okay, otherwise, other clinical examination not remarkable. Okay, what you can see from the focus? 
Okay, we go from the parasternal long axis view. There is a pericardial effusion there. Right. So, the next step is, we want to see either the RV is collapsed during diastole or not. Okay, then we scroll back. The we pause the clip and we scroll back until the valve is open and we see either the RV is collapsed. Okay, if you are not sure, you confirm with other view, parasternal short axis and uh, epical for chamber. Okay, and the last clip, IVC is plateric, distended. Okay, so what is in your mind? Cardiac tamponade. Okay, we move to the next case. Case 3. 68 years old male, known case of diabetic and hypertension, presented with shortness of breath, dizziness, and body weakness. The GCS is 3, V4, M6. One periphery scoop pass volume. The BP 120 60. Heart rate 80, temperature 37, DXT 6.0, SPO2 is 98% under nasoprong. So, what's the clue here? Shortness of breath. Dizziness, body weakness, the GCS is not full. Okay, otherwise looks unremarkable. Okay, this is the ECG. ECG is sinus rhythm. Okay, this is the focus, the left side. Okay, can you see anything abnormal here? You can see the ratio is not one to one to one. The IOT Thick root bigger than RV and LA. So we measure the right side one shows 4.17 cm. Okay. Okay, from the subcoastal four chamber view, there is pericardial effusion, but this is not in tamponade. Okay, and the right side, if you can see carefully from the descending iota. There is a flap inside the descending iota. This is the chest X-ray. It's widened mediastinum. So, what's the diagnosis? Probable diagnosis here. Okay. Sudden onset of SOB. Dizziness. Okay. And then, the BP actually... Taken at the uh, left side. The right side is lower. 80-40. Okay. And they, uh, they, uh, sh he has a radio radio delay, radio femoral delay. So, the probable diagnosis will be IOT that session. Then we plan for CT and uterus. As you can see, this is the real patient, okay? This is my patient. So, the CT angiotorax turned out to be dissecting thoracic aneurysm. Actually, it's dissecting from up to below. It's Stanford A. Okay. Case 4. Okay, just want to remind. Patient elderly will come with uh, atypical presentation. That's why we need our focus to help us in managing the patient. Okay? Okay, we move to the case 4. 67 years old gentleman, no case of diabetic and hypertension, complaint of sudden onset, uh, shortness of breath for a few days and worsening for the past one day. Again, SOB, associated with, associated with chest pain. Failure symptom for the past 3 months, no fever, no vomiting, no diarrhea. She, uh, he is alert and conscious, coolish, peripheries, weak, pulse volume, CRT 2 seconds, BP 8460, heart rate 100, SPO2 90% under room air, RR 28. Lungs crepitation, bilateral lungs, abdomen soft, bilateral pedal edema, arc to knees. What's the clue here? SOB, coolish peripheries, the hypotensive, tachycardic. Uh, SPO to 90% under room air, crepitation, bilateral edema up to knees. This is the ECG. What we can see from the ECG? K 
okay we can see st elevation at avr and diffuse st depression over the other leads okay this is the focus on the left side we start with from the left side you can see the mitral valve barely open the lv contractility barely contracting okay there is a pericardial effusion and the middle one is a poor contractility of the lv and the last the right side directed all four chambers this is the lung ultrasound the right anterior left anterior is p lines the bilateral base got pleural effusion bilaterally so can we chest pain can we sob bp low with the ecg changes with the focus poor contractility with the lung ultrasound b lines and bilateral pleural effusion what is in your mind it's a cardiogenic shock secondary to SF with APO. So take home message. Always find for standard image before we interpret it. Ergonomic and avoid cross infection. Other some findings do not stand alone. Always correlate with clinical findings. Always confirm with other views before make a conclusion. Practice, practice and practice. Thank you.